Severe chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps, or CRSWNP, is a debilitating disease which has a significant impact on patients' quality of life. As our knowledge and treatment options evolve, there is an increasing need to ensure good cooperation across all specialities dealing with CRS. And in this show, we will discuss the work undertaken by Euphoria and EPOS expert members in the quest to improve definitions, communication and treatment outcomes. This is Euphoria News broadcasting from London. Hello and welcome to Euphoria News, I'm Dr David Bull. Chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps or CRSWMP is present in around 1-2% of the European population and it can be incredibly debilitating. As our understanding of the condition evolves and new treatment options become available, it is crucial that definitions related to CRSWMP are constantly reviewed. And with this in mind, a consensus meeting was held in June of this year, which brought together the expert panel members of EPOS 2020 and Euphoria. It sought to redefine several crucial definitions related to CRSWMP, including control, remission, cure, remodeling, disease progression and modification. And the aim was simple, to improve patient care. Well, here to tell us more about this exciting initiative is Professor Valerie Lund. She is Professor Emeritus of Rhinology at the Ear Institute, University College London, and she is also an honorary consultant ENT surgeon at the Royal National Throat, Nose and Ear Hospital at University College Hospital in London. Very good to see you. May I start right at the beginning? Tell us more about the meeting and exactly what its aims were. Well, I'd like, if I may, just to put a little bit of background to the meeting. I hope uh, that's OK to put it in perspective, because if you think about going back historically um, some decades, we gave whatever treatment was available. And then, of course, we went into an era of evidence based medicine, which made it possible for us to debate the most appropriate treatment. But actually assessing appropriate outcomes has often lacked consensus, uh, even though we now have a number of validated tools, uh, such as semi-quantification of the cardinal symptoms and endoscopic findings, as well as measures of uh, specific and general quality of life. So even so, it can be quite difficult to agree what constitutes success and failure of treatment. So in uh, EPOS 2012, we, we, going that far back, we actually introduced the idea of control, which we borrowed from our pulmonology colleagues in asthma. And we then developed this further in the most recent EPOS 2020. But the uh, table that we created then had not been validated. And it was to that end that the consensus group was formed, uh, led by Professor uh, Fockens and uh, uh, Professor Hellings. Uh, and it comprised uh, contributions uh, from individuals who'd been associated with EPOS and Euphoria to look critically at key definitions of uh, treatment targets. And I'm pleased to say that the document that uh, came out of this has just been accepted for publication in Rhinology. So that's uh, very uh, important. Um, as you said at the beginning, um, we looked at these um, really important definitions, control, lack of control, remission and cure. And uh, various um, decisions were made regarding those definitions. And I think they're, they're really um, quite logical when uh, you consider them. Uh, patient reported control, the absence of symptoms uh, within the last month, the lack of control or uncontrolled disease, the presence of symptoms, obviously, remission. That's the sustained control for at least a year. And that usually involves input, input not just from the patient, but also from a physician to look for signs of active disease on endoscopy. And then finally, we have cure, which is sustained uh, remission for at least uh, five years. Now, um, I think that coincident with this initiative, uh, and sort of running in parallel almost, uh, there was another consensus group led by Professors Sedegad and Hopkins, who had been looking uh, with another group, uh, which was often an overlapping group, at the specific criteria that define control. And this was using a Delphi process. And interestingly, out of that exercise came the ideas of overall symptom severity, nasal obstruction, 
and smell. So, so these things sort of form uh, the background of, of the meeting. And I mean, it's, it's really been, I think, a very important uh, step forwards in, in many ways. I think you explained that beautifully, to be quite honest. Let me just ask you, though, in terms of all of this, this was about consensus. I think it was about defining all of these things appropriately. But what does it mean in, in real life, I suppose, for physicians, but also equally, and if not more importantly, for patients? Well, these new definitions help us, and by us, I mean both physicians and patients, to evaluate the effect of our treatment strategies. And that that is really important because it allows us to make intra- and inter-individual comparisons, both in a clinical setting, but also in our future clinical research studies. And, and also what struck me was that you brought together a wide range of specialties as well. So you had ENT, pulmonology, allergology, immunology, for example. Bringing all of those together, was that useful? Oh, I, th I think it's always useful. I mean, uh, I've always believed in a sort of multidisciplinary approach to these sort of problems. And um, I think there's nothing uh, better than to have that sort of cross fertilization that could go on between all, I hate the word stakeholders, but it, it's, it is that we all have a common interest in this particular problem through a variety of routes. And I think that um, it's really important. In fact, it's, you know, you, you, sh you shouldn't be doing it if you can't bring together all the different uh, specialties that have an interest in this area and the patients. That's the really important component, which has often been missing in the past. Mm. And let's just talk about CRSWMP. It's a, it's a condition I talk about a great deal. Just in terms of using that particular isolated condition, just tell me about the value of defining remission and indeed possibly cure in CRSWMP. Well, in, in the document, as uh, I said, you know, remission is regarded as some form of sustained uh, contr uh, control um, over a period of, of 12 months. And if you can push that out to five years, then you have the concept of a cure. And um, I think that that's, that's really uh, an important idea. I mean, one could say that cure is an aspiration very often. Um, in the past, we've uh, very rarely been able to cure chronic diseases. And certainly that would be what every doctor wants to do. But we have to um, understand that there are sort of certain steps in the process. And that, that's why we've taken this sort of rather logical approach of control, remission, and then uh, cure as the ultimate uh, uh, goal, if you like. And I suppose that's the panacea, as you say, for physicians, but also for patients as well. I mean, is it fair to say that we are looking for a cure in the future? Well, that would obviously be the, um, the holy grail, if you like. That's the aspiration, I think, of all doctors and, and patients. Um, and in fact, I could say that the advent of the biologics has sort of tantalisingly raised this possibility if they can be shown to produce uh, prolonged remission by disease modification. I mean, um, I'd have to say that the timing of the therapeutic intervention, intervention could be really important. I mean, we know uh, from endoscopic surgery that earlier intervention with surgery for polyps, uh, i.e. within one year of the onset of symptoms, produces better results if you compare it with a group of patients who waited for over five years for their operation. And that's likely due to slowing down of the sort of progression of the disease and, and stopping uh, the uh, effects of remodeling that goes on in chronic diseases. And the same could be true for the biologics. Uh, certainly there are some uh, indications that's the case, but we need longer term studies in order to be able to um, confirm that. And it, I mean, it's also the case that we actually know relatively little about the natural history of nasal polyps over a, a person's lifetime. Um, so it would be nice to go for cure. I think we should think positively about it and have it as a goal um, so uh, we could get control for our, our, our patients in the first instance. And, and then in the future, I mean, it would be absolutely marvellous. I, I think it would be fantastic if in my lifetime it's been possible uh, to actually achieve a cure for, for what is, you know, a very um, unpleasant uh, chronic disease. Um, but I think the other thing that we always have to be mindful of in these situations is that um, it, we have to be working in close collaboration with patients. Um, we have to be able to balance the risk and benefit of the treatments that we're offering them. Mm. Really good to talk to you. Thank you so much for your time. That's uh, Professor Valerie Lunder. My pleasure. Thank you. 
Joining me now is Professor Amber Luong. She is Professor and Vice Chair of Academic Affairs in the Department of Otorhinolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery at McGovern Medical School in Texas in the United States. Really good to see you. Thank you so much for joining me. Perhaps I may start and ask you, how and why have treatment goals in CRS WMP changed over, say, the recent few years? Well, thank you for having me um, and uh, happy to be here. Well, so, um, you know, chronic rhinosinusitis or CR, uh, CRS with NP with nasal polyps have really changed over the years because we've gotten smarter about this disease. We've started to learn more about the, the, the molecules that are involved in the immune system. We're starting to understand the diseases that are associated with chronic rhinosinusitis and that relationship between the upper airway and the lower airway. So um, asthma, which was I'm trying to imply, we're starting to realize that relationship and then understanding the molecules that drive this disease process, CRS with nasal polyps, and realizing the strong overlap in the immunopathophysiology of both CRS with nasal polyps and asthma and other type 2 immune responses, uh, type 2 meaning those same cytokines that are important in these different disease processes. There's several diseases that sort of fall into that. And it's because of that understanding that the treatments um, have changed and really matured. Initially, it was just steroids and surgery, really, to control difficult CRS with nasal polyps. And over the last several years, um, biologics or more targeted therapies. So understanding those cytokines and developing treatments that can then target those cytokines have really made a big difference. And therefore, why diff talking about treatment goals and changes in treatment goals have, have needed to uh, evolve. And because we're involving so many other subspecialties that share these same disease processes, we need to be able to talk to one another, be able to understand that it's more than just trying to control the symptoms now, but maybe being able to treat so that we're controlling asthma uh, or the progression of asthma and so forth. And as a consequence, that's why our treatment goals have to have changed so that it's not just control, but maybe um, other uh, treatment goals, as well as being able to communicate with our colleagues. So, so you talk very eloquently there about bringing together all of these specialities. And I assume that's why this consensus on novel treatment targets in CRS WMP was needed. I suppose it's so you're all speaking the same language. You all understand exactly what you're talking about. Exactly. That's the 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 real reason and the impetus that uh, was necessary to come together and make sure that when we're talking to our colleagues and saying that the CRS um, with nasal polyps are controlled, they understand what we're referring to. Or when we say that they're cured, they understand what we're referring to. So these definitions that initially really wasn't necessary because we just didn't have anything else to offer patients. So we all sort of knew that whether they were controlled or not controlled, and that's the only thing that we were talking about. And we weren't communicating necessarily as much with our pulmonology colleagues, our dermatology colleagues, our rheumatology colleagues. And so now having this subspecialty um, environment makes it critical to be able to have a, a language that we all can understand. And perhaps you could just spell out for me the difference between control, remission, and then cure in CRS WMP. Yeah, so great question. Um, so with control, it's going to be the focus is going to be on patient reported feeling of control, right? These are the patients that are living with their symptoms <clears throat> and it is a quality of life disease. So control um, is focused on patient reported <clears throat> sensation of being controlled as well as not having symptoms, overall sinus symptoms. So symptoms that are often correlated with chronic rhinosinusitis, um, nasal congestion, facial pain, drainage, those overall symptoms are not significant with a focus on nasal congestion being not 
not significant as well as um, the sense of smell. In addition, so that's, and that can be with or without treatment, right? What you can be controlled, whether you're on a specific treatment regimen or you happen to be having control uh, off treatment. So that's the definition of control. And the implication there is that if a patient is controlled, so there's clinical implications for these definitions. If they're clinically controlled, then the physician wouldn't necessarily need to escalate any treatment at that point, and they can keep the patient on that particular treatment regimen. Now, the other definition that um, our expert panel came up with was remission. And so in remission, it is the similar having control, but over at least 12 months. So 12 months or longer being controlled, meaning the symptoms are well controlled. The sinonasal uh, symptoms that I brought about, the overall symptoms, the nasal congestion, the sense of smell is less, is not clinically significant. But on top of that, there needs to be a component of physician perception that things are controlled. And so objectively going in with the camera and taking a look at the sinus bed and um, and correlating that with the lack of symptoms, meaning that there's not strong signs of inflammation. There's not um, signs of, you know, lots of mucus. And, and finally, if, uh, if I may just ask you this, what difference do initiatives like this mean for the patient and indeed for care in the future? So, you know, I think it's really critical to have these definitions understood because then we not only does this facilitate communication with other physicians who are helping to take care of uh, the patient, but also being able to draw the patient in to the care um, so that they understand these different goals that we have, as well as um the implication is that there are going to be additional treatment options down the road that then can help us get to some of these goals that are currently maybe aspirational, meaning cure. So having those definitions outlined and being clear to everyone, um, all the stakeholders involved, the researchers, the flint, the physicians, the clinicians, uh, the physicians, the multidisciplinary ph physicians that we um, that we collaborate with, and the patients. Those those are, you know, that's where the future lies is being able to have that communication and sort of implied in that these different uh, treatment goals that we have for um, for patients. Fantastic stuff. Thank you so much for your time. That's Professor Amber Luong there. Thank you. So there you have it. That's it for this Euphoria News Show. Many thanks to my guests, to Professors Valerie Lund and Amber Luong. Now you can find more information about Euphoria and you can also register for the Euphoria educational events on the euphoria.eu website where you can also sign up to receive the latest news via email. And don't forget to follow us on social media on YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram and Facebook. Until next time, goodbye.